and we'll get into the lesson. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for uh, Matthew's insights. Um, we're just more and more amazed at what Jesus was and is as far as the miracles, as far as his love for us, and as far as uh, what the convictions are that we need to kind of address in our own lives as we read these chapters. And Lord, I ask that you give me the words uh, that you would hear these folks here tonight. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Well, Frank William Ab Abignali was born in 1948. He's an American security consultant. He's an author, and he's a convicted felon who committed frauds that mainly targeted individuals and small businesses. His exploits were captured in the movie Catch Me If You Can, which was in 2002, which starred Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. Abignali, I think is the way you say his name, claims to have worked as an assistant state attorney general in the United States of Louisiana. He served as a hospital physician in Georgia, and he impersonated a Pan, Am Pan American World Airways pilot who logged over 2 million air miles by deadheading. He also passed $2.5 million in counterfeit checks before he was caught. He spent four months in a French prison. He spent four months in a Swedish prison three years and three months and seven days in a U.S. prison, and three years in a juvenile home in, uh, when he was age 17. Today, he charges $20,000 to $30,000 per speaking engagement. Other than spending time in jail, the Pharisees in Jesus' day sound an awful lot like Frank Abnali. <laughs> Instead of defrauding businesses, the Pharisees defrauded the Israelite nation by posing as true religious leaders. In reality, they were indicted by Jesus as ingenuine imposters. Tonight, we're going to continue our study of Matthew as he attempts to convince his Jewish readers about the legitimacy of Jesus's claim to be the Messiah. The scripture reference is chapter 8 of Matthew, and I've entitled it, How Can You Not Believe? And I've broken it into three different sections. The first, Matthew 8, 1 to 17, three unique miracles. Second, Matthew 8, 18 to 22, three rejected disciples. And then finally, Matthew 8, 23 to 34, Jesus's total authority. So let's start with the unique miracles. Chapter 8 picks up right where chapter 4 left off. So if you're following through Matthew, you would have read the first four chapters. And I don't know if anybody remembers how the fourth chapter ended. It said, Jesus went all over northern Israel healing and preaching, right? That's what he did. Then chapters 5, 6, and 7, there were a break, and what was there? That was the Sermon on the Mount. And there he gave kind of in-depth teaching of what was going on. And then when he gets to chapter 8, what happens? He picks right up again with his healing and his teaching. So that's kind of the sequence that we see. Now, Jesus has come down from the mountain, and he continues his ministry, picking up right where he left off. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees of the world, are getting really irritated with Jesus, right? They're now challenging him, saying, by what authority are you teaching? Who are you? Where did you come from, right? So they're, they're now getting a little nervous because they've seen Jesus indict them. They've seen Jesus do these miracles, and they're having trouble kind of holding on to the power that they've had in the past. And so they're starting to kind of get a little bit irritated with them. And Jesus basically, remember, says to them, you know, do my acts not speak of the authority I have? Do you not know the Old Testament scriptures? I mean, he's challenging them to say, wait a minute, you guys are the religious leaders and you don't know who I am? You don't know the prophecies about me? And so now he's going further and further and bringing more people in. And we'll see that tonight in chapter eight. But what Matthew is saying to his questioning readers, because you remember, he's writing this book to Jewish people that really aren't yet believers. And he's trying to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah and they need to follow him. And if you recall how we've gone through so far, chapter one talked about the genealogy. Those were the legal qualifications for him to be the Messiah. Chapter two talks about his birth, right? The fulfillment of the prophecy, the prophetic qualifications of the Messiah, all covered there. Chapters three through seven, we dealt with his baptism. We dealt with the temptation he had, the spiritual kind of qualifications by defeating Satan in the wilderness, and then the divine approval, right? This is my son who is well-loved and, and, and proud of. 
Chapter six then is, is the sermon, talks about his theological qualifications. Remember people said, well, where did you learn this? You know, who did you study under? How do you know all of this stuff? You're from, you're from Nazareth, you're a carpenter. How can you speak so eloquently about religious things? And now we get to chapter eight, where Matthew selects miracles to demonstrate not only the teaching authority of Jesus, but now the physical authority that he has to be able to heal things. And if you, if you look, there's a very specific kind of chain reaction that he has. He selects nine miracles in chapters eight and nine. We're going to look at three of them tonight. But what he does is he picks the miracle of healing disease, right? So we have the leper, then we have um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the centurion's paralyzed son, and then we have Peter's mother-in-law. So it, it shows that Jesus has control over the physical nature. We then move in and we have him on the, on the sea and he calms the storm. So he shows, Matthew demonstrates now he has control over nature as well. And then finally he gets to the other side and he has demon-possessed men that are there and he casts out demons. So Matthew is now shown in, in a very few verses control over physical, control over the nature, and now control over the demonic world or the mm -hmm. spiritual world as well very important points that he's trying to drive home to his readers so they understand he's not just making this up. Remember, Matthew had thousands of miracles that he could have picked, but he selected these groups to drive home the point of who the Messiah was. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. But Matthew has shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Get on board, Jewish people. Get on board because this is the guy. And, and, and now he's selecting miracles that only could be done by God. And that's what we'll, we'll unpack here. He demonstrates that Jesus is willing to go to the lowest levels, right? The leper. You don't touch a leper. But yet here Jesus is defying all natural rules that are there and actually showing compassion to a leper, which was a death sentence, right? You were excluded from civilization. You were put out outside the, 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 the town. You weren't able to come anywhere near people. Right? If you were anywhere close, you had to have a mask on your face. And if you were within six feet, you had to yell, unclean, unclean. And if the wind was blowing, if it was 150 feet, you had to yell, unclean. So everybody knew that you were contagious and that you couldn't come anywhere near. And yet Jesus welcomes this guy into the crowd, touches him, and heals him immediately. I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting story. And again, if you look at this disease of the leper... It, it touched everything, right? I mean, it would attack the nervous system. It would attack the bone marrow. It would attack the eyes. It would cause skin infections. It, it impacted internal organs. It basically defiled the whole body. There was no cure at that time. For that reason, these people were banished to be outside of civilization and had no contact with people other than with other lepers. Yet this leper had the confidence to defy all the laws that were there. He walked right into the middle of the town and said, I know this guy can heal me, right? I have faith that he can heal me. This is a leper, right? He risked himself being, I, I don't know if it would have been physically attacked, but certainly breaking the law, he would have parted the crowd. No one would have wanted to be near him. And he isn't put off at all about what he is doing. He walks right up to Jesus. And isn't it great what he says? He says, I know you can but I don't know if you will, right? His faith didn't have any doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't have any doubt that he could be healed. What he didn't know, would Jesus heal someone as lowly as a leper? Would Jesus take compassion on someone who was an outcast of that society, who the Pharisees wouldn't go anywhere near, right? Because he was unclean. And yet this guy walks up saying, if, if only he would heal me, if only he could do it. And what a beautiful picture of Jesus coming in and putting a hand of compassion on him and saying, you're clear, you're clean. And, and you know what's great? He then says, I need you to do two things. I need you not to tell anybody. And then I need you to go to the priest because Jesus didn't come to break the law. He came to fulfill it. What did the law say? The law said, if you had a leprosy, if you had that disease, and you were clean, if it healed itself for some reason, you had to go to the priest and get kind of a clearance before you could be reintroduced into society. And so Jesus said, I don't want you to tell anybody. And you know, as you read deeper into this, some of the commentaries said, well, the reason that, that Jesus didn't want him to say anything was because if he went to a priest, 
who was aligned with the Pharisees. And here are the Pharisees that don't want any part of Jesus. It would be easy to say, well, you know what? You're part clean, but not all the way. So Jesus obviously isn't the Messiah because he still got a couple scales here. There's a couple blisters here. That, yeah, so he wanted him to go as if, you know, here I am, you know, I, I'm cured of leprosy. And once he got the endorsement, it's almost embarrassing now to this priest because all the Pharisees are over here saying, no, 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 don't make him clean, don't make him clean. But yet he's giving a clean bill of health because Jesus healed him completely. So what a great story that we see as this guy comes in. But you know what? Look at carefully. There, there's in Luke and in Mark, there, there are similar kind of stories about the same, the same thing. Look what they said. They say the leper came and prostrated himself in front of Jesus. So what did he do? He had faith and then he worshiped, right? He he knew he was the man. And Jesus is looking at, at the faith and saying, didn't say it, but the, the faith has healed you. you. Your belief in me is is is, is an admirable. And, and so he heals him and he heals him completely. He defied all laws and came to Jesus with confidence. And he was more interested in healing than in any loss. But yet, his first concern was to worship Jesus. He didn't ask him anything until he fell down in front of him and worshiped him, and then said, I believe, but will you? And Jesus, of course, says yes. So the word here is he came in humility. He didn't demand anything. He came in faith. He says, I know you have the power. I know you're able to do it. But you know what? Belief in humility and willingness to abide by God's decision is what he did. Jesus touches him. And the crowd gasps. Can you imagine? They're all sitting there listening to Jesus, and he reaches out and touches a leper. He's unclean. He can't, he can't be the Messiah. Why would he touch somebody unclean? See, because our lives, we've been taught by the Pharisees who have told us to stay away from these people. And they're outcasts, and we don't want to have anything to do with them. Right? And Jesus is saying, I'm breaking all traditions. I'm coming with a radical new idea. You want to be part of my kingdom? This is the way we do it. This is what you need to do. Now, there's a great teaching point here by Jesus. And if you look at it, I think he had this in mind as well. Look at leprosy. Sin. Right? It's just, it was a horrible disease, just like sin is horrible. Right? And people don't get saved from their sins until they have a loathsome, a loathsome feeling about those sins. And that's what this guy did. He came. He was so tired of being a leper. And he's saying, here's a way that I can be cured. Right? So he, he was kind of fed up with it. He comes worshiping. He says to him, you can for, you can heal me. Right? But it, it's, it's like we come and say, you can forgive my sins. Right? I'm, I'm tired of the life I'm living. I'm tired of this sinful. I, I just want to be forgiven. Right? And then they, he comes humbly. No sense of worthiness, no sense of rights that he had. He comes meekly. He exhibited all of the attributes that you saw on the Sermon on the Mount, right? And that's the way we come for forgiveness from Jesus as well. He came with faith, right? He believed that God could forgive his sins, and in this case, heal his life for sin. So there's a great parallel if you kind of look at all of the things that that uh, kind of parallel what's, what's going on with leprosy. And then finally, what happens when your sins are forgiven, you got two things you got to do. You got to obey God's law and then go tell other people about it, right? Let your life demonstrate that you have a changed life because of the forgiveness of sins. Second miracle he does is with the centurion. Okay, now a centurion, for those of you that don't know, was a Roman officer that had control over 100 people and, and 100 soldiers. And remember, Rome was occupying this part of the Middle East. They were in charge. Of it. They were in control. Okay. Now they were hated, and they were hated for three reasons. Number one, they were Gentiles, so the Jews hated them. Number two, they were Roman, right? He, they were occupying. They were an occupying force in Israel, so they hated them. But number three, and I just learned this. Okay, the Roman officers and the Roman soldiers weren't from Rome what would happen is they would come in and conquer a country or they would conquer a land. And what they would do is then they would recruit people from around that land to become Roman soldiers. So they would then be trained by the Roman army and they would report up to someone like this centurion. So very likely the soldiers that were actually the occupiers of Israel could have been Samaritans, right? Or they were certainly Gentiles, they weren't Jewish people. So there was a tremendous disdain 
for anyone to have any whiff of being a Gentile or being a Roman soldier. Okay, and yet here comes a Roman soldier. Now, if you read the other kind of uh, um, scripture passages on this, they said it wasn't the, the Roman centurion that came. He sent a contingency of Jewish people to represent him. Why? Because he didn't feel worthy enough. He didn't feel that he, as a Gentile and a Roman soldier, could approach the Messiah. He had no doubt he was the Messiah, but he sent a contingency. Second thing you notice here is that when Jesus said, well, I'm coming to your house. I'll heal this paralyzed servant boy that you have. He said, no, I don't want you to come into a Gentile house because Jewish law basically said you couldn't go into a Jewish house and be, or a Gentile house and be clean. So this guy understood the laws and he didn't want to, to, to disrupt the laws that were there. So he was trying to humbly say, Jesus, I know you are the Messiah. I'm a Gentile, but I believe you're the Messiah. And he said to him, I know, I have faith that you can heal my son. And you know what? You don't even have to be that. I understand authority. What he was saying is I have authority over 100 men. I have to report to somebody who I have to do what they're saying. I understand what it says. So if you just say he's healed, I believe that it's there. And so that was, again, you, you picture the leper coming in humility. Here you have a centurion coming in humility recognizing Jesus is the Messiah. And, and what a great, you know, kind of sight. And, and, and what speaks highly of this guy is the Jewish contingency that came to represent him said, he is a good man. He cares for the Jewish people. He builds synagogues for us. So this wasn't a guy that came in and, and had the iron fist to say, you're under my control as the occupier. He came in and said, I want you people to be good. I want you to be comfortable. And he showed compassion to a servant. Right. And, and servants were treated like cattle. I mean, you know, this guy was paralyzed. Get rid of him. Let's get another guy in here to clean the house. He had compassion over this guy. And Jesus sees these attributes that he has. Yes. And, he, and he's, 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 he marvels at the faith. Because think about it. Right. This is the Messiah that came to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are rejecting him. And here is a hated centurion that is saying, I believe you're the Messiah. And Jesus steps back, and you can see him looking at his disciples, and you can see him looking at the crowd and saying, I haven't seen faith like this in all of this. But well, what a condemnation that is if you're a Jewish person. He's saying to them, why don't you have faith like this guy, right? You guys have all the history. You have the Old Testament. You have all the prophecies. And yet you're sitting here still saying, I don't know, is he the Messiah? And the Pharisees are actually rejecting it. And, and, and yet here, a Gentile who has none of that history, has none of that background, is coming to me in humility and saying, I know you're the Messiah, and, and I have faith that you can heal my son, or, or my, my servant, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, kind of the, the miracles that Matthew is pulling out now to show that the kingdom of God is going to be all-inclusive. It's going to get all of those sickly people that are outcasts here in this world. It's going to include Gentiles. And he even condemns them, right? And this is a direct shot at the Pharisees because they've been teaching the Gentiles are the outcasts, right? And he's saying, you know what? Many people are going to come from the east and west and dine at the table of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You know what he means by that? He means Gentiles. Gentiles are going to come. And he's going to say, and you know what else? There are a lot of Jewish people here that are going to be cast into hell where there's going to be gnashing and grinding of teeth. Because why? because they've rejected the Messiah. Remember in earlier chapters, he said, you want to come to the kingdom, you got to believe in me. You got to believe I am the Messiah. You got to believe I'm the one that can forgive sins, right? And the Jewish people said, wait, wait, no, you can't. Yeah, yeah, only God can forgive sins. They rejected the whole thing, even though they had all of the prophecy and all of the Old Testament pointing to Jesus, they rejected it. And yet here are Gentiles that are coming embracing it with tremendous faith and with tremendous humility. Good lesson for us to understand. All right, we come to the third miracle. It's Peter's mother-in-law. And kind of the way this is set up is it's a, a Sabbath day, and Jesus and his disciples, he's got Andrew, he's got Peter, and he's got John with them, have gone to the service, and they come back to Peter's house with his wife, and the mother-in-law is lying in bed sick. And, and so what does he do? He touches her, and she got up, and she served her. Okay? Now, again, I want you to see the disruption that Jesus is causing here. I want you to see the disruption that Matthew is putting in front of his readers. Jesus has healed a leper, an outcast, 
he is, has dealt with a, a centurion who is a hated Gentile. And now he's dealing with a woman who are considered second tier and not really important. Yet he elevates those out of the thousands of miracles that he could have written about, he picks those three. And what he's saying is this is what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. This is who is going to be in the kingdom of heaven. They're going to be Gentiles sitting there with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? And you guys that think because you're a Jew, you're going right to heaven, uh-uh, you're going to be down there gnashing your teeth because you rejected the true Messiah. Powerful how, how Matthew delivers this. And you know what? I mean, it's if you're sitting there watching this, as I, as the title says, how could you not believe when you see kind of what this is going? Matthew shows us this tremendous diverse group of miracles. The leper, the Gentile, and the woman all are going to be welcomed in his kingdom. And contrast that to the Pharisees' beliefs that are sitting there fuming as they watch this and they don't know how to stop it. And, and he's teaching against what we believe and he's taking and undermining everything we have and all our authority. And there's nothing they can do about it because of the power that Jesus preaches and heals with to show that he's the son of God. You next move in, and Jesus now, remember, okay, he's exhausted. He's been preaching for, for a while up on the mountain. He comes down, he's healing all of these people. And now he's saying, you know what? It's getting too crowded. We got to get out of here. And he says, let's get into a boat and go to the other side. Sea of Galilee is about six miles across. So he's saying, let's get, get in a boat and we can cross over and we can kind of get away from this pressing crowd. But before he can go, he's, he's approached by three people. Okay, the first one is, that is a scribe. Okay, now a scribe is somebody who's an authority of the law, the Jewish law. He's a teacher. So in the synagogues and in the, in the, in the, in the Hebrew schools, these would have been the guys that would have been up teaching the scripture. Okay, and so one scribe comes to him and he says, you know what? I've been listening. I've heard what you've said. I'll follow you anywhere. That's what he basically says. Now, again, think of the dichotomy. This is somebody who's very much aligned with the Pharisees suddenly saying, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. And Jesus says, you know what? I don't even have the comforts that are afforded to wild animals. And what the scribe is actually saying to him is, you know what? I'm kind of comfortable right now. I just want to add you to my lifestyle without giving up anything. I kind of like where I am in life. I kind of am respected by people. I'm, I'm thought of as a great teacher. But you know what? If I could kind of follow you for a bit and kind of understand your teaching as well, think of how that would enhance my resume down the road when I go to teach other, other schools. All right? That's what he's saying. He's, he's not saying, Lord, think, contrast it to the leper, contrast it to the centurion. This guy is coming because he wants to better himself. And he's really comfortable where he is in life. And he just wants to add to his, his resume. And he wants to get more profile and more profile. And Jesus sees right through it. And he says, you know what? No. My being a disciple. And, and again, you got to be careful here because if Matthew uses the word disciple. The definition of disciple is a learner. Okay. For tonight's purposes, you are all disciples of Jack who is teaching the lesson. Okay. <laughs> You're learning tonight what I'm teaching. It's not one of the 12 disciples that followed Jesus. Okay, so he is saying, no, if you're going to be my disciple, general, a learner, and you're going to follow me, it's got to be self-denial. There's got to be sacrifice. There's got to be suffering. It's not a comfortable life. And what you're trying to do is make it a comfortable life. You're trying to sit here and tell me that you're going to follow me, but you're only doing it for your own benefit, not because you're in, in, in love with me and not because you believe I'm the Messiah and can forgive sins, and that you want to go to heaven. That's not your motivation, and basically, I'm, I'm rejecting you. To follow Jesus, you have to have him as a priority, not as a hobby. And that's what this scribe was doing. He was basically trying to make Jesus a hobby. And you know what's great? When you read this, it doesn't say Jesus rejected him. You just don't see anything more written about him. So he's gone. Right, he disappears, and it's kind of like the rich young ruler that Jesus talked about, and he couldn't give away all his stuff and sell it and follow him. He just disappeared. Okay, and then you come next to a personal riches guy, and he says, "You know what? I've I listened to you, and it's fantastic, and it's so powerful. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. First, I got to go bury my father. Right now, you got to understand what he's talking about here. This is a firstborn son." Right, 
And what did a firstborn son get as an inheritance? Double portion, right? So what he's saying, his father isn't dead. What he is saying is, when my father dies, if I were not here, I wouldn't get the inheritance. And boy, would my reputation be tarnished in my family. So Jesus, here's the deal. Let me wait till my father dies. Let me get my inheritance. And boy, then think of the things I could do for the kingdom at that point. Because I'll have money and I'll be free from kind of not having to worry about my father. Just let let's my father die. And Jesus, again, is looking at him and is saying, you know what? Let the spiritual dead bury the physical dead, right? Let the secular world take care of its own issues. You have been called to the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. Right? He is saying, you're called to a living system. Go and preach the gospel. And his point to this guy is that personal possessions were too important to him to leave behind. The price to follow Jesus was too high for this guy. And then he disappears, kind of from what we're writing. Now, the third guy, and this is what I call bonus coverage, because it's in Luke 9, 61, not in our text, Matthew 8. But it's a third guy who says, I'll follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to those that are at my house. Okay, well, what's this guy's deal? Basically, he's under the influence of his parents. When he came home and said, I heard this great guy today, and boy, was he teaching, I think he's the Messiah. The parents would say, now, wait a minute, Johnny, you're not going anywhere. You live here. He was under the control of his parents. But he was basically kind of saying, he that loves, Jesus said to him, he that loves his father, and mother, more than me, is not worthy of me. Now, is he trying to tell you to disregard your parents? No. But what he is saying in all three of these cases is your priorities are not my priorities. Right? Your priorities are comfort. Your priorities are your reputation. Your priorities are your riches. And you have them ahead of me. And therefore, none of you are worthy to follow me as a disciple. Now, before you nod your head and say, yeah, that makes sense, think of your own lives. Right? And we're going to talk about where are our priorities as it relates to us worshiping Jesus. That's a little teaser for later. Mm -hmm. All right. So personal comfort, personal riches, personal relationships all stand in the way of their salvation. You have to come to Christ on his terms, not our terms. There were two statements that were made by the commentators that related to this. I love them both. So I'm going to tell you what they are. These three left Christ to make a comfortable place for themselves in the world and to spend the rest of their lives hugging the subordinate. Isn't that a great description? Mm -hmm. Hugging the subordinate. Do you hug the subordinate? I do. I mean, there's a lot of times that there are other things that are more important at the time than Jesus is. That's hugging the subordinate. That's what these five guys were doing. The other commentator said it like this. He said, the saddest road to hell is the one that runs under the pulpit, past the Bible, and through the middle of the warnings and invitations. And isn't that true? Right? Jesus had just preached the Sermon on the Mount. These people came down from the mountain and were impacted, such to the point that they said, I got to follow this guy. I got to follow this guy. But yet, when he, they really understood the cost of following Jesus, they ran past the pulpit and the Bible and the invitation because their priorities were too important relative to what Jesus needed for them to be followers. It's not what we have, but it's the attitude we have towards what we have. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not condemning wealth. He's not condemning familial relationships. He's condemning them as a priority over Jesus. Good point for us to understand. Okay, finally, we get to Jesus' total authority. Now, the first three miracles were over these. We talked about that. The next three, we're going to look at two of them tonight, and then the next, next time we meet, are over natural and supernatural events. Jesus and the disciples get into their boats, and they cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, you got to understand the geography of Israel. Mount Hermon is at the top of Lake, the, the Sea of Galilee. It's about 9,200 feet in the air. As you come down Mount Hermon, you come to the Sea of Galilee. That is about 200 feet below sea level. Pretty big drop, right, from where it was. If you go to the Dead Sea, that's 1,000 feet below sea level. So as you come down this 
slope from Mount Hermon, you have all of these valleys, you have all of these gorges, you have all of these rocks, you have desert. And as the wind comes down, the cold air comes down, it meets the warmer air as it comes from 9,200 feet down to below sea level. And that's what stirs up these storms. And that's what was taking place here. And if you talk to anybody, even today, they say that the Sea of Galilee is very unpredictable from a standpoint of where these storms come up. You don't always know when they're going to pop up. They didn't have the ability to say, oh, storm forming, there's a tornado watch. They had none of that. So now they're three miles out in the lake. These boats are maybe a little bigger than this table and maybe twice as wide. And they're sitting in these boats that are uncovered. And suddenly the storm comes up and it starts lashing the boat. Okay. And, and what kind of the, the, the verbs that they're describing are the waves were washing over the sides of the boat to the point that they were afraid they were going to be swamped. So you can see them fervently bailing, trying to get all the water out, and more is coming in, more is coming in. And now, remember, these guys are seasoned fishermen. They've been out on this lake before. They've seen storms pop up. They know how to deal with them. But here it says they were panicked, right? They were panicked to the point that they didn't know what to do. Now, they will go and wake Jesus. And right off the bat, you know, if you have seasoned sailors asking an ex-carpenter for help, you're in trouble. Right? <laughs> and, and it said, these guys feared for their lives. Right? And, and what did they say to Jesus? They said, don't you care about us? Right? Don't you care that we're about to die? And Jesus almost irritated. I mean, I don't know how he's sleeping with these waves <laughs> washing over him. But he gets up and he says, you of little faith, you of, of so little belief of, of who I am, right? You are doubting that I love you. You are doubting that I can, can save you and care for you to the point you've just witnessed thousands of miracles I've done. Don't you think that I can take care of you here? That's kind of the, the, the dynamic that's taking place. And he says one word, quiet, right? And what happens is the storm stops. The verb says immediately. Immediately, the sea was calm. It didn't settle down. The wind didn't kind of die down. Immediately, no wind and a calm lake. And they're looking at him saying, wow. If they think they were scared before, right, they were more scared after. Have you ever been scared to a point where you don't know what to do? I mean, I'm not a, 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 a sailor, but I can remember, I don't know, seven, eight years old, going to Niagara Falls. Remember the boat that goes out there? Maybe the mm -hmm. miss. Never anybody been on that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Seven years old, I'm in the front of this boat and it's heading right for the falls. And I'm saying to myself, what are we doing? I mean, at seven years old, I had wisdom enough to say, mom, dad, this probably isn't the smartest thing to do because if the boat gets in trouble, we're dead. Right. And it's a good thing we've got these plastic slickers on because when millions of waterfall on us, I'm sure that's going to protect us. But, but I mean, the point was you were sitting there and you were terrified. Right. And that's the feeling that these guys had. These guys kind of looked at it from a standpoint and they had lost all confidence in Jesus as a leader. They had lost all confidence in, in knowing that he had chosen them and that he had plans for them and that he loved them. Did you ever get there? Forget about being on the water. How about in your life? I mean, have you ever gotten a medical kind of result that says, oh, man, Jesus, what are you doing? How, how could this happen? to me? Have you ever gotten into a family relationship that's broken and be beyond repair and say, Jesus, what are you doing? This, is, this isn't what it's supposed to be like. It's supposed to be smooth sailing, right? And we forget in those times that Jesus loves us and that Jesus is control of everything. Right? And, and yet we know it, cognitively we know it, but when you get into that emotion, the first thing you do is you panic, and you forget about Jesus being there, loving you, approachable, and willing to kind of help you. And it doesn't always solve the issue, but there's a peace there, that there's a confidence that you're going to get through whatever that issue is. That's the lesson that he's teaching here as he goes forward. Boat comes to the other side. And you got two possessed men that are living in tombs that are possessed, legion, multiple demons that are that are possessing both of these guys. Now, what does that mean, demons possessing? It means the demons were in total control of their lives. That means it was speaking, even though it was using their body as transport, 
the demons' voices were speaking. They were living in the tombs, taking stones and cutting themselves. They were sitting there attacking people that came by. The townspeople had tried to bolt them there with, with chains, and they were so strong with this demonic power that they broke the chains. So no one would actually walk that way. And here comes Jesus and his disciples walking up to them. And of course, they came running down. And, and I, I love this. What do they say? Jesus of Nazareth, what do you want with us? What will you have with us? And why are you messing with us now before the time? Their eschatology was perfect, mm -hmm. right? They recognized Jesus as the Messiah. When all of the Pharisees didn't, and a lot of the Jewish people didn't, the demons did. Mm -hmm. And then they said, what are you doing messing around with us before the time? You know what they were talking about? Revelation. They were talking about when Jesus came back, and after his thousand-year reign on earth, what does he do with Satan and the, de and the demons? Yeah. He casts them into the pit of hell, right? And that's what they're saying. They know they're done. Right. And he's they're saying, but wait a minute, we're supposed to have some more time here to play on earth before you put us into this pit. So they know what's going on. And, and so they they are now kind of afraid of Jesus. So again, I it, don't take it just kind of in this. You got to look at it with the other miracles that first of all, he proved that he was over control of the physical nature. Then we just saw that he was control over nature. And now we come and he's also control over the demonic or spiritual world. Right. This is what Matthew was trying to drive home to his Jewish readers. Right. This is the Messiah. This is the promised one. This is the one that's coming to usher in a new kingdom. This is the one that can forgive sins. That's what he's driving home here. So forget about, you know, the two guys who are demons, the demon possessed. He's trying to make a point. This is the Messiah that controls everything. He has authority over everything. Right. And we've seen that develop now through these eight chapters. So what happens? The demon's talking, we're legion, there are a lot of us here, you know, don't be afraid. Jesus says, get out, right? And they say, okay, we know you have authority over us, but can we at least go in the pigs over here? And Jesus says, go. That's all he says. Doesn't touch them, doesn't do anything, just go. And now it says the two men were sitting next to Jesus, fully clothed, talking with him, from possessed and cutting themselves to now sitting next to Jesus calmly, and, and listening to everything that he was saying. Beautiful story. And the pigs run off the cliff. And what happens? The townspeople whose livelihood depended on these pigs, it tells us that because they're they're with the pigs, they're Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And so they say, you know what, Jesus? Cool. You know, you got that those demons out of there, but you just ruined our, you know, our year here. Yeah. But you know, all these pigs are dead. And and you know, if if you don't mind, could you leave? Right? Yeah. Could you could you just kind of get out of town? And, and what I love about this story is it says the one man approached him and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to go with you. And he was sincere, right? He knew what Jesus had done. And he said, I want to follow you. And what does Jesus say? No, no, you stay here. I need you to be the first missionary. I need you to talk to the people in the town that just threw me out and tell them who I am and tell them what they did, what I did for you. Right. And let them understand who the Messiah is. I love it. You know, Jesus could have said, oh, yeah, come on. You know, we, we have plenty of followers. Come on with us. But no, he leaves them there. And do it. All right. So that's kind of the, the story of the, the possessed men. Matthew wants his readers to understand the Messiah has power over disease, over nature and over demonic forces. What more evidence do you need to believe I am the Messiah? God is in the midst of you, right? And the disciples are starting to get it. They're starting to understand they're in the presence of God. Still have their doubts, still have their nativity, but they're starting to get it. And what Jesus is trying to do is make sure everybody understands he is the one that was prophesied to come from the Old Testament. So as we conclude, what, what do we take? From a chapter like this. If you're a believer, it's abundantly clear that Jesus wants our total faith, he wants our total reverence, and he wants our total commitment to him to be considered part of his kingdom. There's a story about Ben Franklin. He, before he became one of America's most successful storyteller, inventor, scientist, and diplomat, Ben Franklin was convinced that he was a moral failure. Disgruntled 
with the disorder of his life and frustrated by the lack of his productivity and bent upon, upon becoming more frugal, Franklin set out on a project he called Moral Perfection. Having made a list of 12 areas of attitude and action that needed improvement, the 27-year-old Philadelphian asked a friend to look over his list. What his friend told him had to hurt a little. The man kindly informed me that I was generally thought proud and my pride showed itself frequently in conversation. And I was told that humility had to be one of the 12, but now the 13th virtues in his project, and he should give it the number one priority. Now, why do I tell that story? Think about your own life. How do you approach Jesus? I often find myself coming to Jesus more like Frank Abagnale, who we started the, the sto story with, fraudulently or deceptively, similar to the ones that approach Jesus and said, I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. I do that, right? But yet, the scribe, was a, it was a hobby, right? The guy consumed with his possessions, it wasn't a priority, right? We studied that tonight. But rather than the centurion or the leper, we learned about tonight, how are you approaching the Messiah? How are you approaching the creator of the universe? How are you approaching someone who is as holy as Jesus is? Where is my mind? I'll tell you where my mind is and my priorities are when I become the, before the Lord. If I do, sometimes I just blow it off. It's the Yankees. How are they going to do in the World Series? It's football games on the weekend. It's family. It's work. It's a medical condition. All of those get into my mind, and I'm thinking about those, and yet I'm saying to myself, well, it's time now for my spiritual time. It's time for my close time with God. And my priorities are wrong. And if I would approach Jesus like these guys did, he would say, go, leave, because your priorities aren't there. I'm not your number one priority. Often, I shortchange my time to commune with God because my priorities are out of whack. And as a result, I don't come to him with humility. I don't come to him with reverence. And I don't come with a worshipful attitude that he demands. And it's those times that I find myself further away from God, not his fault, my fault. Come into his presence. You're on holy ground. Remove your sandals, is what he told Moses. And yet today, I am a holy God and act accordingly in my presence, is what he's telling me. And that's what he told these people in Matthew chapter 8. He said, don't come to me and pretend like the Pharisees do that you want to be a disciple and that you want to follow me. And it's a great word for all of us to think about when we approach a holy God, how are we approaching him? What is our motivation for approaching him? And what is our desire as we commune with him? Is it a top priority or is it something we're doing as a hobby? Or is it something we're doing because it would look cool on a resume? We need to come to him in a holy reverence and humility, just like he taught on the Sermon on the Mount just like he commended those that approached him in that manner. We have a great example here in chapter eight on how we approach a holy God if we hope to be in his kingdom. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, pithy words that Matthew writes, but yet when you dig into them and you understand his point, when you understand what is he trying to accomplish, Lord, um, we can't help but kind of uh, look at our own life. We can't help but kind of assess how are we doing. We can't help but put a list together like Benjamin Franklin did to say, what are the things that I don't do that I want to change when it comes to approaching a holy God? And Lord, let us think about that seriously. Let us sit down with a pen and paper and kind of identify those areas that are blocks of us truly communing with you in a holy and reverent manner. And Lord, there's nothing more than you desire than us to have you as a top priority in our life. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.